Welcome to this podcast on intracranial hemorrhage. Today we're going to talk about some of the basics with relation to intracranial hemorrhage, including the major different locations of intracranial blood. These are generally put into two categories, the first being extraaxial hemorrhage or hematoma, which occurs inside the skull but outside the brain. The four major classifications include epidural hematoma, subdural hematoma, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and intraventricular hemorrhage. Next we have intraaxial hemorrhage, which includes, which occurs inside the brain parenchyma itself. And we'll discuss each of these in detail. We're also going to talk about the etiologies of these different types of hemorrhage and how they can be related to different types of trauma, as well as the anatomic relationships that help determine where the blood will fall inside of the uh, skull. We'll talk about some of the factors relating to prognosis of our patients with intracranial hemorrhage. In terms of some of the basics of head CT, I wanted to remind you that generally the patient's right side is going to project to your left and the patient's left side will project to your right. And here we have just a reminder of some of the main densities that we can see by CT. It's very similar to any other body part that's going to be obtained by CT. Uh, just to remind you that air will be very dark, usually the darkest part of the CT. And water density will be also quite dark, but not quite as dark as air. Here we have CSF fluid that is actually water density filling the ventricles. Next we would have fat density, which is not labeled here on the CT. In general, we don't see a lot of fat in the head, um, although we do occasionally see it in the scalp and subcutaneous areas. Um, more dense than that would be brain parenchyma. The two main densities are represented by white matter, which is generally slightly more dark in density and centrally located, as well as gray matter, which is slightly more dense and in general more peripherally located within the skull. Here we have some acute blood which is labeled along the right aspect of the brain which is going to be more dense. A fresh bleed or an acute bleed will generally be very protonaceous and more dense than the related brain and will be very important part in our evaluation of the head CT. We also have bone, which in most cases is going to be the most dense area on the head CT, um, which makes up the calvarium and the bony areas of the skull. Metal would be the only other or one of the only other materials that will be more dense than bone. However, we don't frequently encounter this within the skull itself. Here we're going to talk about some of the complications of intracranial hemorrhage, one of which, or one of the most important complications would be increased intracranial pressure. This can cause several different types of brain herniations, which are illustrated here in this diagram. We can get external herniations of brain through any opening in the skull, subfalcine herniations, tentorial herniations, uncle herniations, and downward tonsillar herniations. I'm going to have you refer to the increased intracranial pressure podcast for further detail on these herniations and how they can relate to different pathologies. Now we can start talking about the different types of hemorrhage. In our diagram on the left we have this skull which is represented by the yellow circle and the dura which is represented by the black circle. In our first type of hemorrhage we have a, an epidural hematoma that would be located between the skull and the dura. Next we have the subdural hemorrhage which is obviously located beneath the dura itself. We can get an intraparenchymal hemorrhage which is the only intraaxial hemorrhage that we'll be talking about today within the brain parenchyma. And we can get subdural hemorrhage, excuse me, subarachnoid hemorrhage, which will be located 
interdigitating between the different bumps or gyri on the outside of the brain and the sulci or grooves of the brain. This can also be located within the cisterns or the CF, normal CSF spaces within the brain. On the right we have some diagrams from Gray's Anatomy which are illustrating some of the normal anatomic relationships between the different vessels in the brain um, and how they relate to our different types of intracranial hemorrhage. We'll go into detail for that for just a bit. First we have the subdural hematoma. This type of intracranial hemorrhage is often caused by indirect accelerating and decelerating type injuries. Some of the features of subdural hematoma include a crescentic shaped density, hyperdensity, along the surface of the brain, and here we can see that on the right. This will usually displace the brain to the contralateral side or more medially. Anatomically speaking, the subdural space does not have many boundaries and therefore can flow freely along the brain surface. In a larger subdural hematoma, this can often extend the length of the brain. On the left here, we can see an anatomic specimen, gross anatomic specimen, showing us an extraaxial collection, crescentic in shape, along the right aspect of the brain. This is pushing the brain parenchyma medially, and we can help to appreciate this with the displacement of the gray-white junction of the brain the gray material, gray matter of the brain being more peripherally located and the white matter of the brain more centrally located. This also oftentimes follows the sulci and gyri of the brain. So we always want to make sure when evaluating our head CTs that the sulci are extending all the way to the inner table or the inner surface of the skull. If it's removed at all from the inner surface of the skull, then that's not normal and we need to figure out why that's happening. On the right we have some arrows pointing to the bridging cerebral veins extending from the skull to the brain surface. These are the veins that get stretched and sometimes torn causing a subdural hematoma with indirect trauma. In someone who has brain atrophy the brain parenchyma is going to be removed from the skull more centrally located and those bridging veins can be more easily stretched and torn when compared to a normal healthy patient. Uh, as you can guess in some of our elderly patients it may actually not take very much trauma at all to cause a subdural hematoma and that's why we need to have increased suspicion in any patients who might be predisposed to this type of injury. Here we have a case uh, with two images showing a subdural hematoma extending along almost the entire length of the brain on the right. The gray-white junction is displaced medially and the periphery of the brain is several centimeters from the inner surface of the skull. There's also associated mass effect. We can see that the right lateral ventricle is displaced medially and that accounts for a midline shift. Here we have another case with a small, smaller subdural hematoma. Now this case is still rather easy to identify on the head CT. However, if you had an evolving hematoma that maybe was not quite as dense, or you did not have your gray setting or windowing um, optimally set, you could see how it would be much easier to miss a smaller subdural hematoma. And it's important that we don't do that because even though the size of the subdural hematoma itself is quite small, the extent of the damage to the underlying brain can be quite large with extensive cerebral edema and other uh, changes from increased intracranial pressure and mass effect. And these are related to some of the pitfalls of detecting subdural hematomas. On the image on the right, and its companion gross anatomic picture on the left, we can just barely make out 
uh, a crescentic extraaxial collection on the right aspect of the brain. With displacement of the gray-white junction more medially. In this case, it's almost the only sign that we have that there is an abnormality uh, within this head CT. And in patients who are anemic or have innate decreased density within the blood or a more chronic subdural hematoma that has started to evolve and uh, for, have decreased density within it, it can actually be quite difficult to detect these subdural hematomas that are isodense or the same density as the brain parenchyma. Here if we adjust the windowing or the gray setting of our head CT, we can see these two uh, bilateral ax extraaxial collections much more easily. So it's important in a patient where you have increased clinical suspicion that there's something going on within the brain to adjust your settings to make sure that you're not missing something like this. Again, you can help the distance between the sulci and the skull or the gray-white junction in the skull to help you with this. Next we're going to talk about epidural hematoma. This type of intracranial hemorrhage most often occurs with a blunt type trauma such as getting hit with a baseball. There are also a few other etiologies for this type of injury, which we will discuss. Um, the characteristic appearance of an epidural hematoma is as you can see on the diagram here. Usually this would be a lentiform shape. And by that I mean it's biconcave. On each side there's an outward appearance to the extraaxial collection, sort of similar to the lens of your eye. We're also going to get displacement of the gray-white junction with this type of injury. However, as opposed to the subdural hematoma, the epidural hematoma will be limited by the sutures of your skull. The sutures of your skull are lined by periosteum, which will keep the epidural hematoma in a localized area. And here we can see the gross anatomic representation of an epidural hematoma on the left. Again, crescenteric, in sh excuse me, lentiform in shape with displacement of the gray-white junction medially. And on the right, in our Gray's Anatomy depiction, or a diagram we can see here at the middle meningeal artery. This is one of the most common locations for the development of an epidural hematoma in blunt trauma. As you'll remember, the middle meningeal artery courses along the temporal bone, and a fracture at this site could easily injure an artery in this location and cause an epidural hematoma. It's not the only place where we can get an epidural hematoma, or the, but the vast majority of uh, these types of hemorrhage caused by trauma will occur in this location. Here we have a nice example of this. On the right-hand image, we have pointed out a fracture in this patient who experienced trauma. And in the soft tissue windows, we can see the high-density biconcave collection in the front the anterior right aspect of the uh, brain, pushing the brain parenchyma towards the center, causing mass effect on the ventricle, and also associated edema on that side of the brain. So just to review, in a subdural hematoma will generally be crescentic in shape, not bound by sutures and will usually be venous in etiology, whereas epidural hematomas are lentiform in shape. They are bound by sutures and they will usually be arterial in etiology. Next we're going to talk about subarachnoid hemorrhage. And again, this is the type of hemorrhage that occurs on the surface of the brain below the level of the dura. Um, this will occur with injury to any of the vessels 
within the subarachnoid space. One of the leading causes of subarachnoid hemorrhage would be disruption of the circle of Willis, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But we can also get subarachnoid hemorrhage with trauma, and that's actually the number one leading cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage would be in traumatic patients. On the right in our Gray's Anatomy illustration, we can see arrows pointing to some of the types of vessels that can be related to this type of injury. Here we have a diagram of the circle of Willis, and I just wanted to superimpose that on uh, the axial slice on the left, the CT image, going through the supercellar cistern. Here you can see how nicely the circle of Willis vessels fit into the darker CSF areas within the supercellar cistern. That star-shaped darker density is CSF fluid that normally just provides free space, a um, little space within the brain that can easily be filled with blood in a subarachnoid hemorrhage. We can see an example of that here with high density material, again filling that star shape in the supercellar cistern. Cistern is just another word for uh, an area where CSF can collect and space in the, uh, within the brain or within the skull. So here we have high density filling those areas. Uh, we have labeled the interpeduncular cistern on the left. And although this is an extensive case of subarachnoid hemorrhage, in cases with much less blood, this would be one of the areas where blood can settle and can help point you in the right direction. If you, again, have suspicion of intracranial bleed and you can't find it, this would be one of the places to look. On the right-hand image, we have the green arrow pointing to blood within the sylvian fissure. And again, although this is not a subtle case, in cases with much less blood, this would be another key place to look to make sure that there is no blood layering within this potential space. And then we have the blue arrow pointing out the third ventricle which is dilated and this is related to one of the major complications that we fear in subarachnoid hemorrhage which would be hydrocephalus. You can get increased size of the ventricles due to blocking of the arachnoid granulations or clog clogging of the arachnoid granulations related to the subarachnoid blood. If you can remember the arachnoid granulations are the structures that reabsorb the CSF and distribute it back into the venous circulation. And with any slowing or blocking of this process you're going to have basically delayed circulation of the CSF and causing hydrocephalus. So that's one of the things you definitely want to check in a patient who is known to have subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, the patient that we just saw actually had a corresponding angiogram on the left, which depicts a cerebral arterial venous malformation, or AVM, that had ruptured into the CSF space, causing the subarachnoid hemorrhage. Other than trauma, the major cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage would be rupture of a berry aneurysm. And on the right, we have another example in a patient who had an aneurysm. Generally, these occur at the branching vessels of the circle of Willis, particularly the anterior cerebellar artery. And this can easily also cause a subarachnoid hemorrhage to the degree in the patient we just saw. Here we have two more examples. The patient on the left, if you look posteriorly, you can nicely see the large cranial defect in this patient with severe trauma. And I put this case here so that we could see the extensive subarachnoid hemorrhage filling those normal areas or grooves in the brain, the sulci where the CSF usually fills in, um, has been almost completely replaced by blood in this case on the left-hand image. And on the right, this is what I was talking about with a more subtle case of subarachnoid hemorrhage. The blood is falling into the left-sided sylvian fissure with high-density material. And this is a much more subtle case that you could easily fly by when scrolling through your pictures if you are not don't have an 
increased index of suspicion uh, to make sure you're ruling out subarachnoid arachnoid hemorrhage in the sylvian fissures and interpeduncular cistern. Next we're going to talk briefly about interventricular hemorrhage. Uh, the case here is an obvious case with extensive interventricular hemorrhage. The high density material filling the lateral ventricles and this case was actually caused by a hypertensive bleed in a typical location. Uh, this is a thalamic bleed. Oftentimes these intraparenchymal hemorrhages can actually just rupture into the ventricular space and cause quite an extensive interventricular hemorrhage. And again, one of the major fears that we have is the complication of hydrocephalus for the same reason of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. The blood can clog the spaces or the communications between the different ventricles in this case and cause a hydrocephalus. So that's something we're going to want to make sure that we're double checking on every patient that we know or suspecting an intraventricular hemorrhage. And here are two more cases on the left. We have a patient with both intraventricular hemorrhage as well as subarachnoid hemorrhage. And here I just wanted to point out that oftentimes we're going to have a mixed picture in, the, in our patients who have sustained trauma or some other type of injury, vascular injury. Many times you're not going to have just one of these spaces filled with blood, but you're going to have blood in multiple locations. So we can see the high density material interdigitating between the sulci and the gyri of the brain and along the falx anteriorly especially, as well as high density material within the lateral ventricles bilaterally. And in the case on the right, um, I wanted to use this image to illustrate the changes you can see over time with an interventricular hemorrhage. Similar to the other types of intracranial hemorrhage, with time you, and evolution of the hemorrhage, you're going to have decreased density of the blood products. The more acute component in this image is the higher density material layering within the dependent portion of the ventricles. As you can imagine, these patients are often recumbent or lying down during their hospital stay, and you can actually get a hematocrit level with decreased density in the anterior portions or the non-dependent portions with the less protonaceous and more water-dense blood products in those locations and the more acute or dense blood products in the dependent or posterior locations. And again, in this patient, we have enlargement and rounding of the ventricles compatible with hydrocephalus. The last major type of intracranial hemorrhage we're going to visit today is the parenchymal, parenchymal hemorrhage. This type of hemorrhage can be caused by multiple different etiologies, one of which is trauma, say for example, someone hit you on the head with a lead pipe. The brain parenchyma itself is going to squ be squished essentially against the hard bony skull. On the right we can see an anatomic specimen of portions of the calvarium and this is just to remind you that our head is encased in quite a hard substance which for the most part works out really well for us however in certain circumstances it works against us for instance in the case of trauma we don't have much cushioning uh, outside of the brain and the impact of the brain itself with the calvarium can cause uh, damage to the brain parenchyma and hemorrhage not only at the site of injury or a coup injury but also at the contralateral aspect of the injury, which can account for a contra coup injury. In addition, with the swelling that we can encounter with many of these injuries, including a parenchymal hemorrhage, the skull is hard and protective, but also not very expansile, so we can get, again, very easily increased intracranial pressure with no room for the brain to swell. So here would be an example of a coup injury at the site of impact, and then with recoil of the brain, we can get a counter coup injury, again, on the contralateral aspect of the skull or the brain.
Here's an example of uh, an older gentleman who had fallen, slipped on ice and fell and hit his head, um, went home and decided he didn't want to come in until he started to have vomiting and his wife got concerned and brought him in for a CT scan. Here we see uh, a large area of increased density involving the left frontal lobe. There's also surrounding uh, hypo density or lower density representing edema. And in this patient we can also see the fracture line uh, extending almost the full length of the skull. He had actually hit his head in the occipital region and the parenchymal hemorrhage that we can see by his head CT actually represents a contracoup injury. There is no blood at the site of the impact, the original impact, and that's actually not uncommon in parenchymal hemorrhage to have more pronounced injury at the site of the countercoup injury. This is just another example with the gross anatomic representation on the left of a parenchymal hemorrhage and then the CT example on the right with surrounding edema. Um, we had mentioned trauma as one possible etiology for parenchymal hemorrhage. Other things to consider uh, in a patient with no neoplasm would be a metastatic focus. Oftentimes those are uh, associated with large areas of edema. We also want to think about an arterial venous malformation or other vascular anomaly that we've already discussed as well. And other possibilities include uh, infarction that becomes hemorrhagic in a patient who's had a stroke. That tissue becomes susceptible to hemorrhage as well. So we definitely want to keep these all in mind um, when we're thinking about parenchymal hemorrhage. And another thing I just wanted to bring up at this point was the fact that sometimes we have to make sure and keep an open mind about in these patients with trauma or with an event who also have intracranial hemorrhage. You want to know did the intracranial hemorrhage first and the patient fell and had trauma or did they have trauma first and had intraparenchymal or intracranial hemorrhage as a result. So that's just another thing to keep in mind when you're evaluating these cases. Here are two more examples of different parenchymal hemorrhages. On the right, we have a large focus in the temporal area. This exec particular example does not have a large amount of surrounding edema. At this point, it could be in the early phase, and, and those changes may be coming subsequently. And on the right-hand image, we have a large interparenchymal hemorrhage with extensive surrounding cerebral edema and midline shift with the fox actually now located more to the left of the uh, head. And that concludes our talk on intracranial hemorrhage. Thank you for listening and good luck in reviewing the rest of your podcasts. Ugh.